takes pleasure in attracting a stellar list of speakers that address today's most relevant issues. The club's place as a refuge for rich discussion and networking has never wavered after 123 seasons. We are dedicated to encouraging debate on the issues that matter to this city, this province, and this country. The Canadian Club is one of the most important podiums anywhere in the world that a Canadian can speak to, tell Canadians what it is that they think, develop those thoughts. And so I want to thank you for that very, very much. Please join me in thanking our esteemed panelists today. Through our programs and events, including our youth and young leaders programs, our diversity partnerships, our joint events, and our media and social media opportunities, we offer you access to dynamic, political, social, and business figures from abroad and right here at home. The platform from which the eloquence of Canada has flowed all of that time, whether it be business, education, politics, sports, arts and culture. If someone wants to say something to Canadians about this country and about the future of this country, this is the venue you choose. Hello, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Anita McCuit, and I am president of the Canadian Club Toronto. The global pandemic has spurred innovation in all areas, financial, technological, and even participation by retail investors. Today, we're joined by Ontario Securities Commission Chair and CEO Grant Bingo to discuss the transformation underway at Canada's largest capital markets regulator. Before we hear from our speakers, here's some information about how you can participate with us today. The click here to switch stream button helps if you find that your internet is slow. The video quality may decrease, but the audio quality should remain strong. And we do want your questions today. So just click the questions tab, enter your question in the window, and it will go straight to our moderator. Thank you to today's event sponsor, Borden Ladner Gervais. The Canadian Club is a nonprofit and we've been gathering people together for 124 years. And it's because of our sponsors that we can continue to do that. So thank you, BLG. Now to introduce today's speaker. Grant Vingo is Chair and Chief Executive Officer of the Ontario Securities Commission, following over four years as its Vice Chair. Grant is a Senior Leader and Trusted Advisor for regulatory agencies, and is a seasoned adjudicator with cross-border expertise and deep knowledge of financial markets. After his remarks, Grant will be joined for a Q&A session with Amber Canwar, anchor and reporter for BNN Bloomberg. So please send in those questions. One of the club's traditions that has not changed in this virtual world is a toast that we make to our country at the start of every event. So if you have a drink nearby, please join me in a toast to Canada. To Canada. Grant, I'll turn the Canadian Club podium over to you. Okay, thank you, Anita, and good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to thank the Canadian Club of Toronto uh, for providing a platform for important discussions of economic, public policy, and social issues, particularly throughout the challenges of the pandemic. I would also like to thank today's sponsors, Borden, Ladner, Gervais, for their support. I'm pleased to join you um, today for an update on how the OSC is navigating the waves of change affecting Ontario capital markets. I'll leave lots of time for questions, including follow-up on important work um, uh, related to the Ontario Modernization Task Force. Off the top and of importance because these are significant trends we're seeing that fundamentally impact our markets, I'll discuss um, uh, three areas. First, the growing role of retail investing and how it's changing the way we regulate. Second, the recent surge in capital raising. And third, the crypto revolution. Finally, I'll describe the framework, framework we use in approaching new financial products and services and the steps we take when there are threats to investor protection, fair and efficient markets and market stability. Let me begin by outlining the growing role of retail investing in our markets. We usually think of large pension funds and other institutional investors as dominating market activity. 
That has changed since November with retail trading steadily increasing and in February surpassing institutional and high frequency trading to become the primary contributor to trading volume. Retail trading represented about 45% of volume in February. In the US, it actually surpassed 50%. While it has subsided from its peak and is trending down somewhat, there's also a sense that some of this activity has moved to crypto assets, which I'll discuss in a moment. We've seen more trading in the online discount brokerage channel as well, mostly from do-it-yourself investing. Canadian online brokers executed 27 million trades and opened more than half a million new accounts in January alone, and both of those were records. Investors have also been borrowing money at record levels in order to trade, with margin debt up 40% from a year ago. This doesn't capture other forms of credit that could be used for trading, including mortgage equity lines and credit card debt. We've also seen, I think we've all seen collectively, um, the social media fueled spikes in so-called meme stocks, including BlackBerry in Canada, and Canadians uh, trading stocks in the US, such as GameStop through online brokers. In the US, this retail surge caught some short sellers off guard with at least one large hedge fund uh, needing a bailout. The risk of price surges and margin calls comes with the territory for hedge funds. And I mention this only as an example of the impact retail traders have had. We've also seen the emergence of commission-free trading, which relies on spreads and other fees to generate profits. In the United States, revenue is driven by payment for order flow which is prohibited for trades on Canadian exchanges. And that's really an important difference. In Canada, the revenue for these um, uh, dealers has come mainly from foreign exchange fees paid by investors. Finally, and understandably, we have seen an increase in investor complaints to firms, as well as to IROC, and to the Ombudsman for Banking Services and Investments, or OBSI, about service interruptions and delays in answering service-related calls. These complaints mainly relate to certain large discount brokers who struggle to handle the high number of transactions and new clients and the need for human troubleshooting. Improvements are underway, but as the trend continues, so does the risk. So how does this trend change our job? For regulators, these retail-focused trends change our job in fundamental ways. First, to be clear, it's good news that younger and tech-savvy investors are coming to the markets. I think many will convert to longer-term investing and to advice channels over time. Everyone has to learn the lessons of market cycles, and the inevitable downturns will help reinforce the value of advice. In my view, investment firms will pivot to attract and retain fee-based clients by offering advice services that meet the needs of a younger digital generation. We need to ensure transparency in all fees charged by these online and discount brokers. This includes the foreign exchange fees I mentioned a moment ago, which can easily exceed commissions in cross-border trading. We have concerns over potential conflicts of interest related to these foreign exchange fees, and we're looking at them closely. I'm also concerned about how much online trading is beginning to look like online gaming, complete with pop-ups, incentives, and prompts designed to influence behavior. On some US platforms, there were even on-screen confetti drops to reward first trades. Thankfully, this stopped after a lot of media um, attention and and political interest. In Canada, we have easy to install trading apps and first trades that go through before the client's initial deposit has even cleared. While these may be efficient and reflect investor choice, they can also lead to impulse trading. There's a fine line between being easy to use and encouraging reckless behavior. Discount brokers should educate and warn investors, especially in periods of extreme volatility. They can do this without stepping over the line to give advice. And if any firm feels that existing limits on giving advice prevent them from doing this, come to us and we'll help resolve this uh, with our IROC counterparts. 
We also need to step up investor education in the online uh, forums where new traders go for tips and design our messages in a way that will influence behavior. Not many people know this, but the OSC's investor office is active on Reddit forums and is using behavioral principles to better reach investors. Also, we won't be shy about enforcing against those who feed misstatements into the market, either to denigrate stocks to profit from short selling or as part of pump and dump schemes. The Modernization Task Force has recommended giving us new tools that would strengthen our ability to combat market manipulation. On the rising number of service complaints I mentioned earlier, we should ensure that fine print contracts do not prevent investor redress and that OBZ can recommend compensation in these cases. I applaud the steps taken by IROC to address these issues and believe that firms should be prevented from adding new counts at all if they don't have the capability to properly service those clients. When firms hang out their shingle to engage in retail securities business, they must be able to provide prompt, reliable service on all fronts, not just for opening new accounts, but also for existing clients when they need help. We are watching this along with um, our uh, colleagues at IROC. The second trend I'll touch on briefly is the recent surge in capital raising. Capital market financing has been at a remarkable pace since the start of the pandemic, reflecting the significant need for liquidity by public companies. The OSC received close to 700 prospectuses in the past year. That represents a 67% uh, increase from the year before. These included more than 50 prospectuses filed confidentially, under our newly introduced pre-file program, which reduces burden by providing issuers with increased market certainty. Despite this increase in volume, OSC staff have risen to the challenge by continuing to issue comment letters and prospectus receipts well within OSC service standards, which you can find on our website. Our staff continue to be diligent in serving the important role the OSC performs to support capital formation in the Ontario markets. The investing public benefits from the speed and professional care we are taking in this area. The increased number of filings also demonstrates that our system is working well and, and that um, it is cyclical. When there is sufficient investor demand, the regulatory system effectively enables companies to do IPOs and other offerings. The last trend I'll speak about is the crypto revolution. And why do I say revolution? Consider the acceleration of activity in the last few months. In January of this year, global crypto asset market capitalization reached um, a US 1 trillion for the first time. Then in April, just 94 days later, it reached $2 trillion. By way of comparison, that's larger than the assets under management of all Canadian mutual funds and, EF and ETF holdings. It has been a challenge to analyze how crypto assets fit into our regulatory structure and then to assure compliance. We're mindful of the need to balance our mandates and not stifle innovation, ensuring investor choice and investor protection. That said, there are significant investor protection concerns, especially in terms of where the assets are held and the controls in place to safeguard them. No one wants to see another situation like the collapse of Quadriga CX where we determined there were essentially no controls and more than 76,000 investors were, were defrauded in a Ponzi-like scheme. Most crypto dealers and platforms act as their own custodians, running the risk that client assets will not be legally segregated. Without regulatory oversight, investors need to consider what is preventing the misuse of their assets and what protections they have if the platform becomes insolvent. For the OSC, we determined that registration is the route required to afford investors the critical protections they deserve. Against this backdrop, there is only one crypto asset dealer registered with the CSA today, with others in the door, but with many slow to be registered or set on a path to IROC membership. Nonetheless, these firms have marketed their services to Canadians and dramatically increased their assets, and that concerns me. It's not easy for regulators to impose compliance in a worldwide market, 
but it worked to rein in securitized mortgages and credit default swaps after the great financial crisis. And on the retail side, regulation has had an impact on binary options and contracts for differences. We intervened last month to insist that non-compliant crypto asset firms come to us to register. The CSA has provided guidance about the steps they have to take. In Ontario, we set the deadline of April 19th for firms to take the first step or risk enforcement action. Collectively, the CSA has more than 70 firms in the door that are now correcting course. We have reached out to other firms we know are, are selling to Ontario investors and action is underway. Firms that have nothing to hide should embrace the opportunity to enhance confidence in their businesses by seeking registration and appropriate oversight. We have a lot of work ahead in processing applications by these firms, and we're committed to working with them to get this done. Enforcement will also likely be very busy in the coming weeks. Crypto assets and the firms that trade them pose regulatory challenges, but they are not the first, nor will they be the last challenging forms of financial services innovation. With that in mind, I want to comment on the principles we apply to innovative products and services generally. There are three principles that I have found helpful and use as chair of the OSC in guiding regulatory action. First, we must stay focused on our mandates, investor protection, fair and efficient markets, and financial stability, as well as our very recently enacted mandates to promote competition and foster capital formation. The tools for investor protection are disclosure, education, the regulation of intermediaries and advisors, and the power to restrict products or services where it is contrary to the public interest. We are excited about our new mandates and I commend the task force and government for their bold action and I'm, and I'm grateful for their confidence in the OSC to take on wider responsibilities. We must provide the conditions that enable businesses to contribute to growth and prosperity and facilitate wealth creation for Ontario investors. And we must get the balance right so that capital can flow to growing Canadian businesses, innovation can flourish, and consumers have access to a diverse range of financial services from a variety of firms, large and small. In the crypto asset area, and this will require action across the regulatory community, we must provide the conditions for strong and effective, well-regulated third-party custodians to be launched. The second principle is that we should be technology neutral and have a deep understanding of new technologies. We are enhancing our technical capacity even further at the OSC, including in our new innovation office. This team is up and running and includes experts in capital raising and new financial intermediation technologies and services. This will allow us to support and encourage innovative business models. That said, we will not approve a new product or service without applying a well-informed uh, critical lens. Products can be innovative, but fundamental protections for investors must be observed. We will use carefully designed and time-limited experiments in an Ontario sandbox environment to gain experience and knowledge where appropriate. You can expect to see more concerted outreach by the innovation office within days. Finally, and, the, and this is the third principle, we need to develop a common approach across all Canadian regulators. This is critical to avoiding an activity falling between the cracks and no regulator adequately addressing it. Similarly, a common approach will help avoid the risk of regulatory arbitrage where new entrants have an incentive to enter the system through the lightest touch regulator. Instead, the regulatory community must assert a common, principled, predictable, and responsive approach, no matter where a firm is based. The Canadian securities administrators hold out the promise of this approach, as do our relationships with other provincial and federal governmental bodies. We must constantly strive to make effective coordination a reality. It's through these three principles that we will respond to new trends product offerings, and the growing investor appetite in Ontario, a steadfast commitment to our mandate, the building of technical capabilities, and our work alongside other regulators. 
I have full confidence in OSC staff who have shown tremendous professionalism during the last 15 months as they responded to extraordinary transaction volumes, product innovation, and regulatory developments. They are capable, dedicated, and up to the challenge of what lies ahead. So I hope my remarks have given you some insights into some of the most important issues the OSC is considering, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Grant. Uh, I learned a lot in that speech. It was full of great facts. And I have to admit, I kind of smirked to myself thinking about your very well-educated OSC staff looking at Reddit pages and probably having to learn a whole new language <laughs> because yeah. they speak a whole new language uh, on those forums. Uh, but but you, you put some great numbers too to just how big retail trading has become as a percent uh, of the total market. And, and before we get to some of the other questions, I'm just wondering, have you observed any differences between, you know, maybe the characteristics and the approach of the Canadian retail trader or the Ontario retail trader compared to, you know, um, some of the dynamics that we see south of the border? Um, I, I think it's a difference in, um, in degree. Um, retail um, behavior is a bit more extreme in the United States. Like the, the level of um, uh, the use of margin, for example, is, um, is greater in the, in the U.S. Um, and, and there are so many, uh, so many choices available to investors. There are many more um, zero commission platforms that are available. It's more freewheeling. I, despite the large numbers in Canada, I, my perception is that there's still, we haven't reached the extremes that... Um, um, are more prevalent in the United States and the Canadians are more cautious. So I don't think the, the problem of retailization has um, reached the same level as the United States. And I, I don't want to see it go there. So, you know, I think we're intervening at the right time to take measures to dampen that. You know, it's interesting because a, a company might be seeing its stock go up 100%, 200% in a week on, on no fundamental news. They might be prompted to say, you know, we're not aware uh, of anything, but it might be tempting too, right, to go out, take advantage of the price action, raise money through, through share issuances. Is that something ha that has come up? Do you consider, um, you know, what companies need to think about if they're going to try and go out and take advantage of, you know, any momentum they might have on those chat boards. I think they really risk, um, um, you know, market action interfering with their, their financing activities because they can't be sure that that, that spike that they're, they're going to try and hit uh, to get the best um, price for their stock is going to persist long enough. And underwriters are going to be very um, cautious because, um, of um, um, the capital involved in underwriting commitments, the risk of sticky deals. Um, and I, I think um, uh, those companies also have to be worried about um, investor disappointment in, in the aftermarket if, if their prices collapse and they, they don't have the business plans in place to sustain the higher valuation. And all of that should come out through disclosure and it should also come out through um, analysts carefully um, evaluating these companies. So I think it's, it's risky and, and, and technically difficult for companies to like hit that spike and uh, get the best valuation that they could. We have a lot of great questions uh, coming in right now. And before I get to them, I'm noticing there's not too much on crypto yet. So uh, maybe I'll just ask a couple of follow-ups um, to your presentation because it's obviously a key focus for you guys at, at the OSC. Maybe you could just shed a little bit more light on, on what's going on with those exchanges and the challenges, you know, frankly, about exerting your jurisdiction um, in such a global market that has gotten away for so many years uh, of basically growing and developing unchecked. Well, there, there are larger players who, you know, are established in the United States and in Europe and, and some in Canada. Um, at the outset, they probably didn't have the same uh, reputational concerns as um, in, incumbents who uh, uh, established dealers that have continuing relationships with, uh, with regulators. But as they've grown, they've had naturally had more of an interest in having confidence in their platforms 
and in um, having a good reputation associated with regulatory compliance. So I think our intervention is really at just the right moment where um, they've grown to a point um, um, where there's a strong desire to come into compliance and an increasing awareness, um, hopefully through our efforts and others, that um, investors have to be uh, very careful when they're dealing with unregulated entities. And they don't, I think they don't want to be tarred with that unregulated um, um, uh, brush where um, investors can't have confidence. It's a fine balance, as you mentioned, though, be between uh, protecting the investor, but also making sure you don't stifle innovation. As these exchanges come under the OSC umbrella, how are you balancing that? Uh, we talked a little bit about this offline, um, you know, the ability of them to offer a wide variety, say, of, of cryptocurrencies, perhaps in a more regulatory and uh, controlled environment would be limited compared to, you know, one that that can offer whatever coin they want? Well, I think, you know, we recognize that um, despite the increased volatility, um, uh, that there are certain uh, cryptocurrencies like uh, Bitcoin and, and Ether that are so well established and, and have liquid markets um, and that we would characterize as, as commodities, but where the totality of the arrangements transform them into either derivatives or in, in investment contracts. But the ones that are highly liquid and are now very well established, and I think I could count them on one hand, should uh, you know, uh, trade relatively freely on these platforms from my point of view. The ones that are um, uh, not as liquid, um, uh, that are you know, frankly a bit sketchier uh, in many cases, um, you know, we think of those in the same way that we think of, um, of private placements. And they may be appropriate for very sophisticated investors, but not for a mass retail um, uh, uh, investor base. Um, so fundamentally, we think these platforms should control the, um, uh, uh, the products that they make available through um, uh, processes, procedures, and um, that we would um, uh, supervise. Uh, we don't want to get in the business with the thousands of crypto assets of, of actually saying you can't do this one, you can do this one, but we're only really comfortable with the highly liquid ones. And then there are some that are clearly fraudulent or questionable that we would bar, and the others that have to be supervised by the firm subject to our oversight, and we divide it between sophisticated uh, versus unsophisticated investors. So that's difficult, and we have to impose that type of regime through terms and conditions that'll be quite um, tailored to each platform. So a lot of work. I'm, I'm just curious, do you have any thoughts about uh, what Elon Musk tweets about on Bitcoin? You know, he says one thing last week, it's the price is down 40% uh, since he, he tweeted about the environmental concerns. An hour ago, he just tweeted that Tesla has diamond hands. Um, which signals, for those who don't speak Reddit, uh, that presumably they're holding on to the Bitcoin on their balance sheet. I mean, as a regulator watching this, what do you make of that? You know, I'm concerned with, with anyone um, <clears throat> issuing public statements that might not have um, um, a sufficient foundation, um, especially when it's in their, their own uh, perceived interest in, in making those statements and have the capacity for it to be a self-fulfilling prophecy, a statement's made, it has an impact, and it often in, and can enrich the, um, the person making that statement. I don't, you know, I'm clearly not going to talk about um, uh, Elon Musk in particular, but any, so, you know, we are concerned about social media that has that effect, and uh, regulatory action is appropriate to deter it. It's, it can, in the right circumstances, if it moves markets and it's not fair, uh, be regarded as manipulative. All right, uh, let's bring in some of these questions that are really wide ranging. And I'll start with one that was a dominant theme for a while. And this is the topic of short selling. Uh, the uh, viewer asking, smaller market cap companies have been frequent targets of predatory short selling. Experts say that Canada's lax regulations around the practice have allowed abusive forms of short selling to flourish, particularly in the Canadian markets. Ontario's Capital Markets Modernization Task Force has targeted abusive short selling in its final report, which recommended measures 
that specifically target various forms of short selling, including naked short selling. What is the OSC doing to address these issues in particular? Well, I think the, the task force um, um, uh, commentary on short selling was uh, very valuable. They didn't, they didn't take, um, uh, they didn't attack short selling as a whole. Obviously, short selling um, performs many market functions and a lot of short selling is um, uh, completely appropriate. And, you know, the number of um, um, uh, manipulations that um, uh, increase prices, uh, pump and dump schemes, you know, far um, uh, um, uh, outmatches the, the number of uh, cases where there are um, uh, schemes detected involving short selling. But that, that being said, uh, you know, I think there's a need to do a few things. And, and this is aligned with the uh, task force recommendations. We should have a, a stronger locate requirement along the same lines uh, that exists in the United States. It's, it's not enough that, um, you know, the Canadian clearance and settlement system operates to cover a, a, a fail on a short. The uh, dealer should be responsible for locating um, the stock in advance of the short sale. So there's no question that the transaction can be fulfilled. And that would add, ask, uh, act as a protection against naked short selling. I think there should also be more stringent uh, requirements on buying in unsettled transactions where there are fails, and that should deter short selling where it, it hits their pocketbook through capital charges. And I think as well, the task force was also correct in, in, in looking at the risks associated with um, short sales into the market that are covered um, uh, with the uh, private placements and public offerings where there's a certain degree of, of uh, coercion involved in obtaining the stock in some cases, and also where there could be insider trading concerns. So I, we should move forward with fails. We'll have to work um, and with these other manipulation concerns, and we'll do that in tandem with, um, with IROC. Uh, here's an evergreen question for, for the OSC, and I'm going to combine two questions here. Uh, but can you comment on the current situation where Canada has multiple securities commissions rather than a single Canadian entity? And another person asks, is a lack of national regulator creating confusion for investors and opportunities for non-compliance and investor fraud? Well, the Canadian securities administrators, um, it does work effectively to coordinate policies. There are still too many differences um, uh, in regulatory approaches. Um, I'm not sure ultimately if that would have been solved by a national regulator, it would just have taken the debate in-house as opposed to, um, uh, because it also would have reflected um, the national, you know, the regional differences that exist within Canada. But the CSA is a very effective forum for working all of that out. And um, uh, we have to, after now that the uh, CMRA project has been paused, it, it really is necessary for the CSA to even up its game to, to show that it's an effective substitute for a national regulator. And as a participant in CSA um, um, meetings, deliberations, um, um, uh, you know, I, I'm urging that, uh, that uh, uh, our colleagues along with us um, increase the cohesion so that the CSA is um, a truly viable alternative to a national regulator. I have, now we're starting to get those crypto questions uh, roll in. I'll start with this one. How do you anticipate overcoming the hurdle of certain crypto assets not falling within the definition of a security I'm not mistaken, are they sometimes classified as commodities? Yeah, fundamentally, you know, the ones that are highly liquid that, you know, we regard as, um, uh, we might regard as cryptocurrencies that um, um, the really liquid ones like Bitcoin and Ether are, are in our nomenclature, they are commodities. So, um, but the re reality is that um, these platforms don't deliver them to the client at the end of the trade, they hold them, and they often hold them um, in, in an unsegregated um, um, uh, account. Um, so it's really what the investor ends up having is a, a, a ledger entry, and and they're subject to the credit worthiness of the platform and its willingness to actually deliver it. So it's in many cases it's not segregated for the benefit of the client. 
So in, in that case, um, you know, the security involved is not the Bitcoin or Ether itself. It's, it's actually the combination of contractual rights, including, um, you know, the exposure of the client to um, the ability of the platform to deliver it. So that's where the security is created. We think of um, what an investor has in, in most cases is a right to obtain the commodity. And that right is either a security or a derivative. And that's the foundation of our jurisdiction. And for the ones that aren't highly liquid, you know, they are securities. They have, uh, you know, some process or some group that's managing them where investors are dependent on the efforts of others. And it meets the classic definition of investment contract. Has anyone challenged that? Has anybody who exists in the crypto space tried to push back uh, on that to keep from falling under your jurisdiction? There, there, have been, there has been pushback, but it's really receded. I think until there's a, um, a practical ability to um, deliver um, the crypto asset out to a, a wallet that's solely in the control of the client and not the platform, it's going to be very difficult for anyone to assert that it's not within our jurisdiction. It meets all the classic tests in our case law and in our legislation to either be a derivative or a security. And have there been any discussions about how to regulate so-called non-fungible tokens? So this is in for those that don't know, uh, in cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, one Bitcoin is indistinguishable from another. You don't care which one you have but a non-fungible token is attached to something, say artwork or a collectible. And that's kind of how we've seen it play out right now. Um, and there's value around it, sometimes millions yeah. of dollars uh, around it. What have your discussions been like around NFTs? Well, you know, we do recognize that there can be things that exist in digital form that are collectibles, you know, that, um, um, uh, and, you know, we don't regulate, you um, um, trading cards or um, uh, the holding of artwork. And, and even if, um, you know, they're, they're, um, there's an infrastructure around those collectibles, um, um, there's a line where they're clearly non-securities. So the analysis that we would apply would be very similar to um, uh, other forms of crypto assets. Like what is the infrastructure that surrounds it? What's the dependency on um, uh, the efforts and services by others, and is the um, um, is the uh, NFT solely in the um, um, in the control of of the ultimate uh, investor, and not um, held in a manner that really gives an investor no more than a, a right to delivery if if the uh, holder is credit worthy and willing to deliver it. So it's a very similar analysis, but we haven't um, pursued NFT cases to date as we're working on the broader crypto asset uh, uh, area. This one picks up on uh, one of the things you mentioned in your speech, Grant, uh, that you mentioned a 40% increase from last year in the level of margin debt by retail investors. And of course, debt is uh, an ongoing theme with Canadians, whether it's how much they're taking on to buy homes or now potentially to uh, buy stocks. Are securities regulators considering any initiatives or actions to, to curb this trend for retail investors? Yeah, and, it, and that 40% is overwhelmingly retail. Um, it, it is total margin, but institutions tend not to, um, you know, uh, take out margin loans from brokers as much in, in, in Canada. So it's predominantly a, a retail phenomenon, and it's large. Um, you know, so far, uh, when there have been issues, uh, investment dealers for their own protection have, have modified um, uh, house margin rates. Um, it really is for their protection because, you know, they're exposed to, um, um, uh, they're at risk if, if their clients fail to perform on um, a trade and, the, and then the dealer will be responsible for the clearance and settlement of that trade. So, uh, you know, firms themselves, and when they see undue volatility, will restrict margin, um, uh, actually eliminate it or uh, not permit short sales, which are a type of margin transaction as well. Um, regulators can do it too. IROC um, uh, has capital and margin requirements, and they can change them. In, in extreme cases, uh, we, together with IROC, would 
consider doing so, but it would be kind of an emergency situation. And to date, the firms um, have um, uh, uh, done it themselves um, for their own uh, protection, but also that has a, an effect of dampening um, uh, volatile trading activity in those particular names. And those firms too, and, and, and we as regulators need to balance that type of intervention uh, with also um, the principle of investor choice. Mm. But we don't want to just shut it down and say you can't trade something that um, that's entered the public market. So that too is a balancing act, but the firms are taking care of it so far. So that, I guess, do you distinguish um, between the firms? We kind of saw that uh, play out in the United States where there's questions about um, you know, certain discount brokerages and, and how they were uh, allowing their investors to trade. Do you think about perhaps implementing restrictions on a tiered basis, you know, depending on whether they're trading in a bank account or a discount brokerage or kind of one of the new entrants? I, I think principles of, um, you know, uh, that are involved in the extension of credit um, should be the same for for investment dealers, uh, regardless, and 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 it is also self correcting because many of the the U.S. firms that um, do it yourself firms that had the greatest um, exposure, um, you know, found themselves in trouble and had to restrict trading and um, had uh, potentially very large clearinghouse calls and had to secure um, emergency loans. Um, so I think the um, the market was even self-correcting uh, in relation to the extremes in the United States. So I don't, at the moment, I don't see a basis for tiering it that way. But uh, you know, it's something I could think. I think we should think about more. But that hasn't occurred to me uh, as a solution. In in your speech, um, you you painted a picture of a very robust and busy year uh, for staffers at the, at the OSC. And uh, one person is asking, what is the OSC doing for its staff regarding things like work-life balance and other measures? And is the OSC investing in and increasing staffing at a time where obviously the demand uh, on their time is really huge right now? Well, we are trying to increase staffing. And I, I think in that regard, we're, we're competing with um, uh, the street and hiring good people who can continue to carry out that work. You know, the OSC is a, a wonderful place uh, to work. And, you know, for me, it's been the, the most uh, enjoyable and, and uh, stimulating environment I've been in throughout my career. And it's, a, uh, it's wonderful to work with my colleagues and who have a sense of mission. So they're not, uh, usually they're not the people who are pursuing the last dollar on the street, but it's still a challenge to, uh, uh, it's still a challenge to recruit. But we are, trying to fill needs. And there are uh, some particular areas we've been hiring in our innovation office, our enforcement um, uh, group, which is um, uh, a significant proportion of our professionals, you know, has also seen a very large um, uh, number of um, uh, cases to be assessed. And we're recruiting in that area and clearly in corporate finance. And we're both looking at long-term and short-term solutions. And we are focused on um, uh, work-life balance. You know, I get a lot of letters from market participants thanking our staff for, um, you know, working late on a Sunday night to facilitate a, a receipt first thing Monday morning on a prospectus. But we have to reward those people, and 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 they can't be expected to, um, you know, uh, to do that indefinitely. Um, so we're trying to do that through our uh, the, our ability to uh, have variable pay and bonuses. We're um, trying to do that by you know, modulating the work as best we can and bringing in help. And we've been really focused on mental health as an issue and have brought in um, new resources, um, uh, including online resources increasingly as a, a counseling tool at, at the OSC. So all of our managers are intensely focused on that. They've received, um, um, you know, uh, instruction and training to be able to modulate the, um, the work of their staffs. But we're not the only ones in that boat, so I don't want to be uh, um, saying we're uh, different than all the other organizations that are going through similar issues. We're, we're facing them as well. Uh, one person asking, when will individual investors be able to make multi-leg stock trades on Canadian stocks in most major trading platforms in Canada? So that's the ability to basically execute on, on two or more um, 
options traded at the same time. Huh. You know, that's that's one I'm, I'm going to have to um, uh, look into a bit further. Sure. Um, it seemed specific. I didn't know if... It's a, it, you know, I, I know there's an ability to do uh, multi-leg transactions, and I'm not sure if it's a, a broker limitation, an IROC rule that, you know, because options at, at the at the beginning of options trading long ago, it was uh, considered a, um, a much more um, unusual and novel, um, you know, market innovation, which puts current innovation in perspective. So if our rules aren't up to date on that, uh, we should revisit it. So I, I'll take that back. One of the, the new innovations, it's not new, but there certainly was a boom of it uh, south of the border, these special purpose acquisition corporations. Uh, big boom, and uh, I guess you can call it a bust now uh, in the U.S., a bit of a pullback. Uh, how was the OSC watching that, viewing it? I don't think we saw it to any kind of magnitude here in Canada, but, but how do you think about those vehicles? Yeah, I, I think, you know, the big difference, there are a few differences between Canada and the United States. SPACs can proceed in Canada, but there there hasn't been the same um, uh, interest. Part of it is it is less costly to do a, a regular public offering in, 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 in Canada, and it, it gets done um, um, more quickly um, uh, in many cases. Also, we do, um, and I won't say this is a, a completely... Uh, positive factor, but um, you know we do have a much more wide uh, spread use of uh, reverse takeovers as a way of um, of going public, and um, and also of um, of um, um, uh, you know other methodologies for bringing venture uh, companies public. And I think that that really um, um, has been the reason that that um, along probably with the caution I mentioned uh, earlier, um, the greater caution of Canadian investors has prevented SPACs so far from really taking off. I mean, we look at the SPACs in the United States and probably all seen stories about a diner in New Jersey that uh, yes. you know, is actually going, uh, has a, a valuation of uh, hundreds of millions of dollars. So, you know, um, we see that with, uh, and are glad that that hasn't uh, entered the Canadian marketplace. You mentioned that that's not necessarily a good thing on, on reverse takeovers. Do you want to just expand on that and how you think about um, the the dynamics there? Well, what we want to be sure of is that there's no regulatory arbitrage, that if someone's entering the capital markets through the prospectus system, that the oversight that the exchanges are exercising uh, to facilitate those uh, RTOs is just as rigorous. And, um, you know, the I think the exchanges are doing a good job in that regard, but from time to time we... Um, um, you know, we see um, instances where we would have done something differently or we would have intervened to um, uh, prevent particular transactions. And then most recently, we saw the possibility of crypto asset trading platforms to come back to that, actually entering uh, the public markets and raising capital um, through RTOs, becoming publicly traded yeah. companies at the same time that they were floating our registration requirements. So that was coming to mind as I was making that comment. But we've Have, stopped. <laughs> you've, st you've stopped it. So you were able to su successfully kind of engage in enforcement activity. Well, it wasn't enforcement activity. It was really mm -hmm. an understanding with the exchanges that um, uh, they wouldn't consider. After we published um, our guidance um, and the, the rules were clear, that it wasn't appropriate for um, platforms that uh, had not been registered um, and in compliance to access the public markets through RTOs or through public offerings. So we have we have about five minutes left. Uh, one of the other questions coming through. Uh, just going back to this, you talked about the CSA kind of being this. In the absence of a regulator, you have this collaboration um, on the part of the CSA. On task force recommendations, would the OSC consider moving ahead independently of the CSA on certain priority areas in Ontario where national consensus cannot be reached in a timely manner? It's a possibility, but you know, our, our, our default is to do it on a harmonized basis. And then you have to consider the practicality of it um, and the politics of it. The practicality is if, if one jurisdiction imposes a rule um, is it going to be effective across the country? And, you know, is it appropriate uh, and in what circumstances 
for Ontario, given its, um, uh, the, its size and importance of the market, to say we're imposing a rule and it's going to become the de facto rule across the country. That's a very non-collaborative approach. And, um, you know, if it's absolutely essential, if, if there's um, a compelling Ontario um, interest in moving forward with something, it's not out of the question. But the entire community is better served with um, a harmonized Canadian system. So that should really be the exception to the rule. And a coordination should be the norm. All right. Uh, oh, you were on BNN Bloomberg uh, earlier today and asked you this question, but I'll ask for uh, this audience as well, just to uh, end on crypto. Um, so exchanges is one way that you're looking to regulate uh, this market. The other is through the acceptance uh, of ETFs, and the OSC has been kind of a first mover there. Uh, what gave you the confidence to kind of go out and, and be the first mover there? And do you expect the SEC at some point will also uh, green light cryptocurrency ETFs? Well, you know, I think um, um, the the evolution of the um, um, of the ETF uh, discussion in 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 Canada, you know, did give us ultimately the comfort that we should proceed with um, with those filings. You know, uh, major accounting firms were now auditing uh, the holdings. Um, the particular ETF providers had. Um, um, uh, custody solutions that address many of the problems that I, I discussed. Um, and um, uh, also bringing uh, crypto assets into a regulated channel where, you know, ETFs can be purchased through registered dealers with dealer and, and, um, and, and regulator oversight um, it, it, on balance is a, a better alternative than um, to have completely unregulated activities. So I think with suitability and with the other protections in place uh, for transactions in ETFs, it was the right time to do it. Uh, the SEC is facing the same issues that we did. And, um, you know, I, I can't speak for them and the issues being in flux, but um, for the really liquid um, uh, crypto assets, I, I would expect, um, you know, worldwide, in, including um, at the SEC, for that to change over time. All right, Grant, thank you so much uh, for all of your answers, your time, your speech, um, but super candid thoughts. And I really uh, appreciate it. And thank you to everybody for your amazing questions. Very insightful. Uh, and before we wrap things up, I'd like to bring in uh, Anita McCuit for some final words. Anita? Thanks so much. Guests, thanks for spending your lunch hour with us today. Grant, Thank you for joining us. It's clear that the OSC is working hard to meet the challenges posed by today's ever evolving market, including researching those Reddit forums. Mm -hmm. um, Amber, it's always wonderful to have you join us and thank you for your expert moderation once again. Guests, we thank hope you. that you'll- Indeed, Great, uh... right, yeah, I'm so glad you can make it. Guests, we'll hope that you'll join us for some of our upcoming events. Tomorrow, we'll host Ian Scott, chairperson and CEO of the CRTC, to discuss how internet services have become even more vital during the pandemic and the CRTC's efforts to promote more choice and affordable wireless services. And on Thursday, May 27th, we'll host founder and managing partner of Mavericks Private Equity, John Ruffalo, to discuss opening the doors on his newest venture and the importance of resilience at every stage of business and life. Thank you again to BLG for sponsoring today's event. We could not hold these events without our sponsors, so we do appreciate your continued generosity. Thank you to our AV supplier, Van Valkenburg Communications and LiveMeeting.ca for making it possible for us to come together virtually today. Guests, thanks for joining us. Please stay healthy and stay safe.